Thank you, Jordi, uh, for the introduction and also to, for inviting me, you and Maurizio, for inviting me to come here. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, so basically today I want to give you an overview of the research that we have been conducting in Brazil uh, in the past, I would say, six years. More specifically in the tropical montane cloud forests in southeastern part of Brazil. Uh, and I will give you an overview of the system first, of uh, why we are studying cloud forests. And then I will go more specifically and talk about the more, some of the more recent work on water relations of these plants and the interaction of vegetation with clouds and fog. Um, so before I move on, I just want to, to say that this work is actually is, was conducted by our group. And at that time when we started this research, uh, the, the group was mostly Clayton, Paulo, Fernanda, Carol and Steve Burgess. They're all involved in this, this work. So all of these, they're uh, PhD students at my lab. Okay, and uh, so why do we study cloud forests? I think the, one of the things is that they're very unique ecosystems on Earth. They, I think the most uh, striking outstanding features of, uh, of a cloud forest is the occurrence of frequent fog events uh, yeah, constantly. So the occurrence of, of clouds define several uh, features of the system, uh, the microclimate and also how the vegetation functions. And uh, uh, this is just a very uh, simple map, just showing that these forests, they, are, they occur all over the world, okay? So, we, oops, in the, in the new tropics, in Africa and also in Asia. Uh, and they, despite this wide distribution, they actually occupy a very small area in the tropics. So they actually represent about 1.4% of the tropical areas of, tro of tropical forests. So they are not, they do not occupy a very large area, but they have a, a major relevance for both in, uh, for biodiversity and also uh, they are also very relevant because of provision of several ecosystem processes. I will, I will go on to that very soon. So if you look at this map, this was the, the Myers map that was published uh, in 2000, the, the hotspots of biodiversity. You can actually see that there is a, almost like an overlap of these areas in the tropics, like the whole Andean regions, uh, with the cloud forests. So uh, they usually, they, they are basically they are islands in, in the tropical areas that have very unique uh, climatic conditions. And they have a high, a lot of endem endemic species that only occur there. And they're extremely species rich for a number of taxa as well, including both plants and animals uh, as well, okay? So, well, this is just uh, an overview of uh, uh, one of our sites uh, looking from underneath the forest. These uh, features uh, that characterize cloud forest includes a lot of uh, epiphytes, both mosses, and in this case, a lot of bromeliads as well. Um, and yeah, this, this is a very common view, like uh, the, the radiation is usually diffuse uh, because of the clouds. So uh, these forests, they, uh, they're also very important because they, uh, as I said, they perform these uh, cloud stripping. Basically, when fog comes, uh, it uh, reaches the, the, the canopy of, this, of these trees and a lot of this water is actually intercepted. And this water can actually move different pathways. It can actually drip into the soil uh, or it can flow via the, the branches and the stem. This will be stem flow. Or, and this is what I want to share with you, there's a, an alternative pathway that it can actually be absorbed directly by leaves. This is something that is not very well known, but uh, we already have some evidence that I would like to share with you about this, uh, these uh, physiological processes. So this is exactly what usually happens. Uh, most of the fog, when it's intercepted by the vegetation, it falls via through fall to the soil, so it can actually uh, recharge the soil. So these forests, they play a very important hydrological role. Okay, they, they really intercept, they strip these clouds and uh, uh, they contribute a lot to the hydrology of, the, of, the, of, this, of this region. Um, well, despite this widespread occurrence and the fact that the clouds occur all, most of the time, they actually occur uh, on a very wide uh, uh, rainfall gradient. 
There are cloud forests that occur in areas with uh, rainfall, uh, this is annual means, as low as 500 millimeters per year, all the way to 4,500 millimeters. So it's a very wide uh, rainfall uh, gradient. And most of the cloud forests, tropical montane cloud forests, they occur in areas where rainfall, annual rainfall is lower than 1,000 millimeters. Okay? And both seasonal and interannual droughts are very common in this tropical mountain cloud forest. So we usually associate these systems with uh, being constant wet, but this is not really true. Uh, this is, uh, the seasonal droughts are occurring. Uh, there are periods that uh, VP, high VPDs can develop when clouds are not occurring and also with very low uh, uh, precipitation. This is just to show, this is just the uh, mean monthly uh, rainfall for our site. You can actually see here these five months in this year where precipitation uh, rainfall was actually quite low. Um, well, and there is also, this was a very influential paper that was published uh, about 18 years ago. It's a, it's a modeling uh, study that basically it suggests that um, with uh, increases in temperature, with climate change, the, the, the fog might actually start to occur in, uh, up in upper layers. So this fog uplift would be a phenomenon that would become more and more common in the tropical mountain cloud forest. So that would mean that uh, this forest would receive less uh, water input via clouds. Okay, so that they are considered particularly vulnerable to climate change because they live in these very unique uh, microclimatic conditions that if they change, uh, the, the species basically they don't have uh, a place to go. They usually occur on the top of mountains, okay? Um, well, and with this in mind, this very general uh, overview of, uh, of uh, uh, tropical mountain cloud forest, we decided to implement uh, a field site mostly to first document in a, a high temporal and spatial resolution uh, microclimatic variables. So we deployed, uh, this is a site in the Serra da Mantiqueira. Serra da Mantiqueira is a mountain range in the southeastern part of Brazil. It, uh, it runs for about uh, almost 1,000 kilometers north to south. And uh, so basically we chose the top of one hill and we implemented, uh, I'll show you the, the design very soon, but basically the idea of this uh, 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 project was to first characterize the fog regime in this, in this area, how often, when it occurs, uh, what, what time of the day, uh, which season, uh, and also how fog impacts the functioning of this, uh, of the dominant trees, both in terms of water relations, but also uh, carbon gain and growth. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of uh, ecophysiology, how the, the cloud is actually influencing the physiology of, this, of these trees. So this is just to give you an overview of uh, uh, where the Atlantic forest occurs. Uh, our site is located here. It's uh, in the state of Sao Paulo, uh, where we work. And uh, this is just a, a photo of one of the one of the peak areas in this in this mountain range. This is called uh, uh, Pico das Agulhas Negras. It's the the Black Needles. Okay. And above 1,800 meters, uh, these areas are dominated by either cloud forests or by, well, it's a kind of a alpine tropical vegetation, it's called Campus de Altitude, okay? So those are the two dominant vegetation types in this, in this region. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very special and unique region uh, with um, a unique flora and fauna. Uh, if you have the, the chance, you should visit one day. <laughs> and uh, well, usually these cloud forests, they, they are not very tall. The average uh, tree height is about 12 meters. So it's very contrasting to lowland tropical, uh, tropical uh, forests. Yeah, this is just another picture of one of the peaks where we, we work, uh, above the clouds in this case. Yeah. And this is our site again. So we implemented a, a wireless sensor network in this region. Well, at that time, we, we basically we were working with some computer science people and they wanted a, like a high density of sensors. So they said, okay, you should put as much as you want. And nowadays, I think it was too exaggerated, to be honest. <laughs> but basically, we were able to deploy about 500 sensors in this forest uh, just to understand uh, the, both the spatial a variability in a lot of these microclimatic variables. And we divided the, the, the area that we sample in 16 forest plots. In each plot, we have a number of sensors installed, okay? In each plot, we also have had a tower. 
So this is just to show the configuration of our sampling design. We had these 16 plots uh, and we, in each of these plots we had a tower and with the tower we had uh, all the sensors. It's basically relative humidity, temperature, this is radiation, wind speed, leaf wetness, rain gauges and also a lot of uh, sensors to monitor the f occurrence of fog. So those are uh, fog collectors that we build. Uh, soil moisture as well, and also some vegetation uh, sensors to actually monitor uh, the, 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 the performance of the species. So basically, uh, set flow to measure water use, and uh, high resolution dendrometers to basically uh, measure growth of these plants. So this was the experimental design. I will not show all this data. I had to, <laughs> to make a, a cut just to simplify the story. This is just a, an overview of uh, how it looked like. Those were the fog collectors that we actually built manually. These were connectors with um, rain gauges on, on the bottom. Uh, so fog would passively be uh, collected through these, intercepted. So we could quantify uh, and all the micromat sensors. Those are arrow trees for those of you who who have heard about them, they, they are quite common in this area. Uh, yeah, and these are the towers. So we had uh, sensors on the top of the towers just to characterize the, the canopy conditions and also we had the same sensors in the understory. So we had a, a to total of uh, 34 small stations with all these microclimatic uh, uh, sensors. Uh, yeah, you can see the taller tower here. The same tower. And uh, uh, on, in addition, we also uh, deployed a visibilimeter because we thought that these would be, perha it's perhaps one of the, the, the sensors that we can have more reliable data uh, to quantify occurrence uh, and frequency of fog. Uh, so this was uh, just uh, as our reference to, to be able to compare with the other sensors that uh, there is some uncertainty associated with their measurements, especially the leaf wetness and the passive fog collectors. In addition to that, because we have this interest in understanding uh, not only the microclimatic variation, but also how that affects the hydrology of the forest, we also deployed some uh, hydrological measurements. Basically, this is the stem flow setup. Basically, we want to, to understand how much water, uh, fog water, is actually being flowing through the stems. So this was the setup. It's, those are just hoses that we had to attach to the trees. And then there was a, like a rainfall collector here, a uh, rain gauge. Those are the, the vegetation sensors. This is a high resolution dendrometer. And this is a set flow sensor. I will show some data uh, that we collect from this uh, sensor very soon. Uh, we also used uh, stable isotopes to try to trace uh, water uh, on, the, on the system, basically to try to address the question of uh, how much water from the fog versus rainfall is getting into the, into the system. They have distinctive signatures and a lot of ecophysiological um, variables uh, we, also, we also measured, uh, like especially water potential and the gas exchange. Uh, on top of that, we, we also installed some catwalks just to have access, direct access to the, to the canopy. Uh, so this is just an example of, uh, of the catwalks. And uh, to complement these studies, we did uh, several greenhouse experiments where we can actually could control the conditions, the microclimatic conditions and also the fog regimes to better understand how the fog affected the physiology of these plants. This is uh, an iconic species in the cloud forest. I don't know if, if you have heard about it. It's a, a winter racer. Winter racer is a basal angiosperm. Uh, it's an angiosperm, but it has the, the hydraulic system of a pine, of a gymnosperms. So it has tracheids. So this is the dominant species in our site. It's a, it's a very, very interesting uh, species. And it only occurs in cloud forests. As you move below 1,800 meters, it basically disappears. So it's really associated with this uh, cloud-dominated uh, ecosystems. Uh, well, uh, our, in the greenhouse, basically what we wanted to know is if plants are receiving only water uh, via their leaves, what will happen with their overall, per overall performance? So we did this uh, experimental setup where uh, plants were exposed to only fog uh, in, the, in the leaves, so the soil was completely covered. Uh, plants that received water in the soil and plants that were facing just drought. Okay, um, well basically this is just a, a first data uh, results. Uh, 
this is still we're still working with this data set it's it was too much data <laughs> that we collected but basically what i want to show you here is that uh, the duration of fog uh, was much higher during the night so uh, the, not only the duration but also the frequency so in this site uh, fog usually starts to occur at the end of the day it also tends to 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 last for most of the night okay uh, well, this is just to show that both stem flow and through fall are, can contribute a lot to, to, the, to the water input to the system as I showed before. This is not uh, specifically that interesting, uh, but we were able to quantify these two processes. And fog do affect both through fall and stem flow. Uh, sometimes about 20% of the, of the water input is actually derived uh, from fog. Okay, so let's go now make this, this link between uh, all these uh, hydrological processes and the physiology of the plants. Uh, usually cloud interception uh, is a function of um, uh, uh, stem flow through fall. And as I said, this, there is also this component of a foliar water uptake that uh, is another, perhaps another pathway that water can move into the system. Uh, another effect, potential effect of a fog is uh, uh, suppression of transpiration, okay? So I will go into this uh, very soon. Let me start with um, uh, this broad question, how fog impacts the functioning, the ecophysiology of the dominant species? Well, first we wanted to know if this process is, it does occur uh, in this, in this, in for, for these species. Basically, we, want to, we, want to, we wanted to understand the foliar uptake of fog water is an important water acquisition mechanism for, for, this, for these plants. And, uh, well, this is just a very simplified uh, scheme of how a, a tree moves water, how we usually learn how a tree moves water. Usually water is absorbed by roots, so it moves from the roots, uh, from the soil, moves up uh, through the plant and out into the atmosphere through the leaves. I think this is uh, very simple, we all know about this. Uh, and this is the soil plant atmosphere continuum, okay? The spec model. I just want to point this because uh, the work that we have been conducting, we are actually showing that uh, not all trees function only this way. There are apparently alternative ways that water can move through plants. So this is coming very soon. Um, uh, well, usually when uh, fog uh, like reaches the vegetation, it, the first thing, it increases the leaf wetness, and usually the presence of a water film over leaf, it tends to def uh, reduce uh, diffusion of CO2 uh, a lot. Okay, so basically one of the, perhaps one of the first consequences of uh, fog and leaf wetting events is decreasing photosynthesis. So maybe it's not uh, uh, something that uh, would in improve the performance of these plants. Um, but water can also be absorbed directly by leaves. Uh, there has been a number of studies showing that this is actually, it's a phenomenon. Nowadays, I think we, we, it has been documented for a number of species. There has been some recent uh, uh, reviews showing that uh, for the more than 100 taxa and for all the species that had been uh, investigated for uh, looking at the occurrence of this process, I would say that about 90%, 95%, they actually showed some evidence that it can actually occur. So it seems to be a common phenomenon that occurs in different types of ecosystems. Um, and for cloud forest, I think the first uh, data that I want to, to share, the first uh, uh, evidence that we had that actually water was being absorbed by leaves was uh, via this uh, tracing experiment where we created a deuterium enriched fog. So we basically we created fog that was enriched in, uh, in the heavier isotopes of hydrogen. Uh, we exposed, uh, this was done in the greenhouse, we exposed the trees to this enriched fog. And basically we could see that uh, this is just the, the, the changes in the isotopic composition of leaf and small branches after they have been exposed to fog. Okay, so basically this is showing that uh, compared to the control plants, the plants that received this fog, they did show the signature of the enriched isotopes uh, inside the xylem. Okay, and this had also a major effect on the water potential. Basically, so for those of you who are not familiar with water potential, it just uh, this, this positive changes means that the plant has hydrated 
after uh, being exposed to fog. So fog was not only absorbed, but also had a, this major physiological effect. Uh, it in increased the, the water potential of these plants that had been exposed to fog. So this was uh, the first evidence that we had that this uh, species that we studied, they could absorb substanti substantial amounts of, uh, of fog water through, through their leaves because the soil was completely sealed with, uh, with uh, plastic. And uh, this water actually caused an increase in leaf water potential. Okay, so if you want to know more details about uh, this first, this was our first study on these um, uh, dominant species, Dreams brasiliensis. A key, key question that we still don't know much about is actually uh, how fog moves in uh, from, the, from the atmosphere all the way to the inside, inside the leaves. So what are the anatomical pathways involved in the process of foliar water uptake? So to address this question, we, we did some, also some tracing experience. We used uh, fluorescent apoplastic tracers. And you could see here, in this, these are the plants that received the apoplastic tracers, that water could actually diffuse directly uh, through the cuticle of these plants. And usually these, uh, these species that we study, they have a, a lot of uh, hydrophilic compounds, uh, both in the epidermis, but and also in the, in the parenchyma. Uh, usually pec pectin uh, compounds near the midrib, they're extremely abundant, and all these compounds, they're extremely hydrophilic. So they might also contribute uh, as uh, holding this water inside leaves. So this is just a, a, a first evidence that the water can actually move via the cuticle. The, and uh, we also have evidence that water can be absorbed directly via uh, trichomes. So this has actually, I think there is a very active group here in Spain uh, working on this same issue, the role of trichomes as uh, organs uh, that can actually absorb water. So these trichomes, uh, both these type of trichomes, but also uh, these glandular trichomes in another species, they also, uh, we are also, we are also able to sh demonstrate that water was absorbed through these trichomes and showed up directly in into the xylem. Okay, so apparently trichomes are very important as also a uh, water entry pathway uh, for uh, water uptake via leaves. And the same anatomical pattern uh, for these other species that had trichomes, uh, they, uh, they have a lot of uh, both the trichomes and also the parenchyma. They are very rich in all these hydrophilic uh, compounds, mostly polysaccharide sugars and phenolic compounds. Okay, but uh, a big question is, okay, we know that uh, some of these plants, they can actually absorb water, but uh, do they absorb water in the same way? Uh, are the ecophysiological consequences the same. Uh, so with this in mind, we, we actually did more detailed experiments to uh, investigating uh, the role of fog in hydration, in photosynthesis, uh, stomatal conductance and growth. And basically, uh, this is just the first uh, data showing the foliar water uptake capacity. And this was just uh, derived from some of those data with both the isotopic uh, work uh, and also with the leaf water potential work that different species, they might have different capacities to absorb water. Okay, so some species that seems to be, uh, have a higher capacity to absorb water. This was Dreams brasiliensis. And these different capacities, they actually had uh, uh, the, this fog effect is basically how much uh, the fog increased uh, the water potential, how much uh, the fog actually hydrated these leaves after they have been exposed to some droughts. And basically, the plants that had the higher foliar water uptake capacity, of course, they also uh, were more hydrated. So this is basically showing that uh, there is some, some functional variation in this, uh, in this process within the community. This is only three species. We, we haven't done this for the whole community yet. <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's not really the, the objective uh, here, but it's basically to show that there is some variation and the consequences, the ecophysiological consequences are also different. Um, well, and this is just a, a simple uh, simulation of uh, how long each species would take to completely desiccate and reach each, its turgor loss point, which is just this variable uh, that basically when the, the leaf loses its turgor, uh, when the plant is exposed to a, a, a very desiccating atmosphere or to a normal 
atmosphere. We use this normal as the average of the VPD of our, uh, of our forest. And basically, uh, we, we could observe that uh, this plant that is the one that actually had the lower capacity to absorb uh, water was the one that was actually regulating their stomata more and was the one that uh, actually uh, could persist longer photosynthesized with their stomata open uh, for longer, uh, basically because it was the one that was, was uh, controlling water loss. So this is, I mean, this is very preliminary, but it sort of suggests that uh, maybe plants that do not control a lot their stomata, they might rely more on uh, fog water to hydrate, okay? Uh, yeah, and this story is also, uh, it's already described in this, in this publication here. Um, well, what about uh, the effect of fog on water fluxes? So I have shown you that uh, model, the spec model, that water moves from the soil uh, through the plants to the atmosphere. And we wanted to know when the fog comes, what happens to this, to, this, to, the, to the water in the xylem, okay? So uh, to do that, we installed these set flow sensors. And this is a, a special type of uh, set flow sensors. It's called the heat ratio method. This method is actually, we can measure not only low velocities of set flow, but we can also measure uh, in, in both directions. So we, we, can, uh, we can tell if water is moving uh, thrown, uh, towards the leaves, or if there is any kind of reversal, we can also uh, document the reversals in set flow. So what I want you uh, to pay attention to this figure, there's a lot of information here, go through these figures. Uh, the first thing is that, uh, so those are all set flow uh, of, uh, of a species. This is under uh, a, a greenhouse experiment, these two plots, and this is under field conditions, okay? So let's see, the first thing I want to highlight is that under um, the glass house, you can see this, this is representing the night. And you can see here, this is just evidence that these plants, they do transpire at night. So this is called nighttime transpiration. And this was a period without fog. Okay, so when there is no fog, this species is actually losing water. Okay, this is the first thing that I want to point here. Um, the second thing is that uh, both in the field uh, and also in the greenhouse, those lines here, these black lines, are representing times that uh, we documented fog, okay? So you can actually see that uh, the, the leaf wetness, leaves are completely wet, is represented by this here and also by these uh, two, three peaks here. And also VPD was very low. So basically VPD was very low, leaves were, were at, wet, and uh, in the under field conditions and under glass house conditions. And the most interesting thing is that during these periods, what happened to the flow? If you look at these negative numbers, this was actually a, a sensor installed in the, in the main uh, branch. You can see full reversal of the flow. So this is just regular transpiration. You see this daily pattern here of transpiration. And these negative numbers, both here in the under field conditions and also in the greenhouse, high magnitude reversals, basically the water was moving from the leaves, through the branches, down to the, to the main stem. Okay, so uh, it's just being represented here by this arrow. Uh, well, and another question that we had, okay, we now know that water can be absorbed by leaves, uh, that uh, these water absorption via leaves, they can actually cause reversals in set flow, in the water flow of water. But can this water actually reach the soil? So, I mean, I know this sounds a bit uh, counterintuitive. <laughs> that, uh, that's, I don't know if this is a, a, like a common uh, a phenomenon. Ba basically, but we are curious about, okay, if we have the full gradient, uh, let's say a very dry soil and a saturating atmosphere around the leaves, can water be moved all the way from the leaves, all the way to the soil? So to, to answer this question, we, we designed another experiment where we, we had the same, the soil was completely covered with, uh, with these uh, plastic. Uh, and we did uh, also a tracing experience using isotopes. So basically we exposed these plants to a uh, deuterium enriched fog. And then we traced fog, uh, this fog water all the way to the roots in the soil, okay? And this is just showing the changes in the isotopic com composition of soil water 
for plants that receive this enriched uh, fog and for control plants. And you can clearly see here uh, that this, the, the, this, this, the tracer, the deuterium tracer showed up in the rhizosphere. So this just was the first evidence that water was actually moving from the leaves all the way to the soil, at least for this plant, that is the, uh, for Dreamis brasiliensis, that the one that has high rates of uh, leaf water absorption. And this figure also shows that what is driving this is actually just gradients of water potential. It's the same driving force, uh, because when plants transpiring, it's basically the, a desiccating atmosphere that is driving the water flow from the soil all the way to the leaves and all the way to the atmosphere. And this, in this case, we have reversed the gradient. So if you pay attention here, uh, this is the pre-dawn water potential. It's just representing the, 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 the water status of the soil. Okay? And this is the change in the isotopic composition of water in the soil. So you can actually see that the plants that uh, had drier soil were the plants that actually uh, transported more water to the soil through foliar water uptake. It's not very strong, but there is a, a, a trend here. Okay? So basically it just shows that uh, this uh, inverse in, in the water potential gradient is actually the same as the driving force for water movement uh, to the soil. Is it at the greenhouse? Sorry? Is, is this at the greenhouse? Yes, 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 yes. Not 12 meters. No, no, that's a very, that's a very good point. Those are small uh, plants. They were about a meter, and a, a meter and a meter and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe, I mean, maybe for tall trees, this is not really, yeah, who knows? We, we haven't been able to, to document yet. Uh, this is also, uh, I think it's an interesting uh, data. It's uh, more recent, this was done with the Araucaria, uh, Araucaria trees, those uh, iconic gymnosperms, also very basal. Uh, and this is the set flow velocity, uh, and this is the water potential, and you can see this very strong relationship. Uh, you should pay attention that these are negative numbers. So those are actually reversals in set flow. So basically the magnitude of the reversals uh, in set flow varies in function of the uh, pre-dawn water potential. It's the, same, it's the same thing that I just demonstrated here, but this here is much stronger for, for this plant. It's basically the dry soil that is driving these reversals in the sap flow, okay? And finally, uh, like what are the consequences? Does it matter for these plants, uh, for their overall performance, uh, if they are receiving fog, if they have this uh, leaf water uptake? So now let's look at this, the whole plant uh, sort of carbon balance. So starting with some, uh, first with some ecophysiology, basically uh, these are the three treatments. Uh, the, the light one, the gray one is the droughted plants. Uh, the one with the dashed lines is the control and the, the continuous light is, line is fog. Basically, I would summarize here, this is uh, pre-dawn, this is midday water potential, this is photosynthesis tomato conductance, and this is relative uh, soil moisture. Okay, basically what I want to summarize, what I want to say here, I try to summarize, the, these are all indexes of uh, uh, like how uh, like stressed these plants are, and you can actually see here that uh, the, the plants that receive drought after that, that receive fog after two months, they maintained the same hydration levels as the control plants. Okay, and these also uh, sort of maintained uh, photosynthesis in similar levels between the fog plants and the control plants, and much higher than the droughted plants. And finally, uh, in general, the plants that received fog, these are all greenhouse data. They uh, actually maintain growth more, this is just the changes in diameter, okay? So they actually, that their growth rates were, were more similar to the control plants compared to the droughted plants. Leaf area was maintained intermediate between the two uh, treatments. And uh, survival ship was also intermediate, but uh, uh, yeah, there was a much lower mortality of these plants after two months. So basically, this is just summarizing uh, the, our, the, the results of this exper experiment uh, after two months without adding any water to the soil. Okay, so basically these plants they were 
uh, receiving full sun during the day. At night they had fog uh, and they were receive not receiving any, uh, any, any uh, water in the, uh, in the directly into their roots. And they had a, a slightly higher survivorship than the droughted plants. So let's come back to the, to the spec model, to the soil plant atmosphere continuum. Uh, basically what I want to add here is just some extra arrows, okay? But after all these uh, uh, things that we learned uh, from these cloud forest plants, I think they have been good models for us to actually uh, fully understand this sort of dynamic uh, water transport system. Basically water can move uh, through roots, uh, but it can also move from leaves all the way through branches uh, down, to, down to the soil. This was um, a comment, commentary that uh, Gregory Goldsmith uh, uh, wrote after we published one of the, our first papers. And it's a very, I, I like this figure quite a lot because it basically show all the scenarios uh, where plants can actually be exposed uh, under natural conditions. This perhaps is the most common scenario. Basically the soil tends to be, the atmosphere tends to be drier, more desiccating than the soil. So that's the, re the reason why water moves uh, from the soil to the, to the atmosphere, the water potential gradient is in this direction. Uh, this can also occur, uh, especially for uh, pl like plants that uh, are perhaps a bit in, in the drier conditions, but uh, water uh, can be absorbed via leaves and recharge internal tissues, not necessarily move all the way down. And finally, uh, water can actually be absorbed and moved all the way down to the roots if the water potential gradient has been reversed. So I think this, this figure sort of summarizes uh, these uh, contrasting uh, scenarios that plants can be exposed uh, in their habitats. So I'm just proposing here that maybe this, uh, uh, the, the spec model might be not unidirectional but multidirectional. These arrows here is, uh, is just adding the hydraulic lift because some plants can actu actually move water through the leaves. Uh, tap roots can, be, can actually transport water all the way to uh, lateral roots that can be released into the soil. So I also added these two arrows here and this extra arrow here. Okay, so let's, uh, let me summarize uh, our main conclusions. So foliar water uptake is an important water acquisition mechanism for this, for the tropical mountain cloud forest species. Uh, species, they do differ in their capacity to absorb water through the leaves, so there is some functional diversity. Um, and this capacity this, uh, actually determines the ability of the species to rehydrate <coughs> after fog. So some species can actually uh, hydrate more after they receive a fog through their leaves. So basically, uh, under these drier conditions, not only uh, lower rainfall, but uh, maybe fog becomes less frequent, maybe some plants might desiccate more than others <coughs> because some of them might rely more on fog to maintain their uh, uh, hydration. We observed the phenomenon of hydraulic redistribution, which is basically the this reversals in set flow when the plants were uh, exposed to fog during these fog events and this was mediated by stems as opposed to roots as has been described before. Uh, and this fog can actually suppress nighttime transpiration. Uh, so this is also uh, usually plants that transpire at night, they might uh, show uh, negative water potential, they might actually desiccate somehow. So this would also be an important uh, contribution of fog. And finally, it might be one of the components to, that might have some relevance to the eco-hydrology of these forests. Uh, not only through fall when the, it's part of the, the, the water that is intercepted by trees might actually be absorbed directly by the, by the plants. And finally, just to put in a broader perspective, uh, the flow of water in stems and roots uh, are actually multi-directional and are controlled by these competing demands uh, in the, between the soil and the atmosphere. So I just want to uh, thanks again, uh, Jordi, Mauricio, and all of you for, for coming, uh, and also the graduate programs at uh, our university uh, and our funding agency in the state of Sao Paulo, FAPESP, that funded all this research. Okay, thank you.
talk. Um, so um, compared to fog, mm -hmm. uh, other sources of occult uh, precipitation in the in the in this particular uh, vegetation type, you know, the cloud forest. So uh, in other words, obviously this is going to be the dominant uh, source that, that's mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the name itself of the, of the biome. But uh, would you expect also that due uh, condensation would occur, uh, and how important would that be? And uh, yeah. you know, if you compare that with uh, also uptake of, of um, of water would occur also through uh, when you have the rainfall events directly. Yeah. No? Yeah. So how do we separate all these various sources? Yeah, I think this is a very good question uh, because I've been I have focused a lot on fog here, but plants do not differentiate uh, if it's fog or rain or dew. They're all water, so you're, you're very right. I, I think it actually it's not only fog. Um, yeah. I think wh whenever you have uh, any kind of precipitation that uh, wet the leaves and and if you have uh, some kind of uh, gradient in theory water could move in it could be precipitation uh, could be rainfall water dew is very important especially in semi-arid environments that usually a lot of water can condensate over the surface of the of the leaves and not do not drop into the soil so apparently uh, I think the relative importance of these different precipitation types depends on the overall hydrological conditions of the of the environment. So, for example, in, in more in drier sites, if you have these small precipitation events, for example, uh, dew formation, uh, they might be enough to hydrate the leaves uh, and allow, for example, gas exchange for one or two hours during the extreme drought uh, during the, the, the extreme dry season uh, for example so this has been documented for example uh, more recently in the in the Caatinga in the semi-arid forest in, in Brazil that uh, dual occurrence they yeah they they were able to was enough to maintain uh, to allow uh, like stomatal conductance to be higher than droughted plants for at least two hours in the morning so uh, even in, in rainforests, I think this can be a very important um, process as well. Uh, I think rainfall, I, I don't, this is actually something that I'm starting to, we should dig more this, this data set. Most of the rainfall precipitation events, even in, in tropical uh, lowland forests, they are events that do not really wet the soil. There is more precipitation events that uh, wet the, the crown but not reach the soil. And they would have somehow the same uh, impact in the hydration of this plant. So it would be very interesting to differentiate the, 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 the different characteristics of all these precipitation events. Because if it's a major rainfall event that wets the soil, I mean, the, the gradient is gone. But if you just have this light rain, I think it would be exactly the same uh, effect. So I think it's a very good point. How, uh, for example, in mm -hmm. the deuterium experiment, you manage to uh, separate, to discern between uh, uh, the fog water enriched in deuterium that mm. actually enters the plant through the leaves uh, yeah. and uh, the component that uh, possibly, I don't know yeah, yeah. how yeah. and if it's possible, but uh, by dripping along the stem, for example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. reach the rhizosphere and be uh, absorbed mm -hmm. through the okay. most classic way. Yeah, yeah. Well, so my, the first uh, part of the response, uh, we, we made sure that we sealed, we had sealed completely the base of the stem with a plastic and paraffin to avoid this contamination uh, of, uh, of the fog dripping the soil. So that, that was the first thing. But Indirectly, you raise the important issue as well that, um, uh, uh, like working with these um, isotopes, they might actually, if you expose plants to some uh, like a saturated atmosphere, there might be just exchange of some uh, of some uh, isotopes that not not necessarily uh, means that uh, there has been uh, uptake. Uh, so in, in the case of these plants, uh, I'm pretty confident that this isotope data, data is actually showing what uptake because we, we sampled uh, organs outside the leaf. So actually fog, uh, the water had to actually move inside the xylem. 
And the most ext extreme case was actually the water that we could, we could detect uh, in, the, in the rhizosphere. So, so after that, uh, in this case, I think this was a very useful methodology to document this process. Yeah. Did you detect a sort of gradient in uh, this uh, isotope concentration? Well, yeah, that's... Mm. Downwards towards the areas. Well, I wish I knew that this was going to occur because that would be the ideal kind of uh, uh, like uh, 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 data that to, to show that maybe more here and less here in the in the roots. But we basically we did by steps because we first had done only the experience to show if water was, was being absorbed by the, the leaves. And then we, we did another experience to actually see if what is actually being moved all the way to the soil. So they were different experience and, uh, yeah, and because of uh, uh, yeah, sampling and, and resort surveyability, we could not do the analysis for all the, yeah, for all the tissues at the same time. Oh yeah, that's that's a very very good point, and I think agronomists they know this for a long time. I mean, they uh, if there is anyone here that has ever worked with uh, crops, uh, they like foliar fertilization is a common practice in in, in, ag in ag ag agronomy. So basically, they put a solution of nutrients over the leaves, and the plants feel happy, and and uh, and, they, and they and and I'm sure that uh, nutrients can also come in. In fact, I was talking yesterday. Have you measured the leaves? No, but I think this is definitely a next step. I think uh, nutrients, how much is actually being brought. Uh, and how, how much can actually be absorbed, I have no idea, but I wouldn't be surprised if it, it's, actually, it's actually relevant. And also the microbes, uh, I think that would be a really fascinating thing. Is, uh, after uh, I, I had a, a great conversation, I learned yesterday that actually microbes can move around the atmosphere through clouds, rain, and, uh, and I'm sure fog might be also one of, the, of these uh, uh, also, uh, one of these means of transporting microbes. So, Roselle, that that would be very interesting to to uh, look for. There is an additional issue with with nutrients. Yeah. Is that uh, if transpiration is uh, reduced because of the high time hours that are wet, yeah. Then uh, nutrient uptake is also reduced, and I wonder if. There is any way to quantify? I mean, yeah. saying that take, foliar take can be important. The loss of nutrient. Yes, take yes, you, you, you're, you're very right. It's never only one direction, right? Uh, we know that uh, uh, there can be actually be leaching of nutrients from leaves during some precipitation events. So I think what we really don't know is actually the the balance, the outcome of all these these two processes. Uh, my my guess, my, my just a hypothesis is that uh, since these events, they actually they are really minor. They basically they just wet the leaves. Uh, I would say that maybe the input is higher than the loss for this kind of event. Uh, I think during rainfall, then rainfall might actually uh, contribute to some of the leaching of the of the but this is something that needs to be tested how different precipitation events uh, leads to as input of both water and nutrients versus to uh, somehow loss so I think that's a, a good a good question as well yeah now that you see that you have the plant anatomy I wonder if you are doing any study on the what you said the permeability of the coating somewhere Talk about it yeah, well, are you doing any work on this direction? Uh, <laughs> Danny, uh, she, she's actually uh, doing, uh, she has recently done some very interesting work on the chemical composition of the, of the cell walls. And she basically showed that depending on the chemical composition, you can also have different permeabilities of water through the, even uh, the, the cell walls. Uh, usually when you have more pectin uh, in, in relation to cellulose, you, the, usually pectin are more hydrophilic, right? Yeah. So, so uh, I haven't done myself, but uh, yeah, Danny, which we are collaborating, uh, uh, has done recently. So 
uh, I think this is a very important component of the story, is, uh, is the chemical composition. And on top of that, uh, when we were doing this work, well, I started to read a lot about the, the, the literature on cuticles and cuti cuticles uh, function. And for me, it was, was a, whole, a whole new universe because I have learned before that cuticles are usually just these uh, layers of um, uh, waxes that completely seal the leaf and they're just non-dynamic structures. But after seeing some uh, work done by people in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s, cuticles, they can be extremely dynamic. They can change their 3D configuration, they can produce all kinds of compounds depending on the micro meteorological conditions. And these will also affect their permeability. So I thought this was very interesting because depending, uh, basically, uh, if the, what, I, what I learned is that when the atmosphere, uh, the VPD is lower, the atmosphere is more saturated and uh, the, the cuticle tends to become more permeable. So it's plastic. And we, we try to test that uh, in a greenhouse experiment. Basically, we just use a very simple mean to test this uh, uh, permeability by looking at the, how repellent was the surface to water droplets. So we just um, exposed plants to three months of fog and plants in a regular atmosphere. And after three months, the surface of the leaves, I should have put this data because I thought it was quite interesting. The, the surface of the leaves, they become more, became more hydrophilic. Basically, the, the, the droplets of water, they were just spreading around. While the plants that were in the dry atmosphere, they were more uh, repellent. So this somehow shows that they can also change these um, uh, physical properties. Okay? You, yeah. Yes. And so yes. for them, the flow of that seems very strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they got me thinking about the evolutionary history of this mm. mechanism. Yeah. So you were looking at this, this cloud forest in Brazil, and I'm curious, like, have you demonstrated that this trait exists in trees in other yeah. cloud forests? And then mm -hmm. what about variation in that trait in non cloud yeah. forest environments? I work in the boreal forest yeah, in yeah, Canada. Yeah. So what sort of mm -hmm. variation is there in systems that might have not been exposed to the selective pressure yeah, yeah. of cloud forests? I think this is really a great question, and uh, no, no, really, because I think that's usually for any kind of biological work, we always need to put into uh, this evolutionary framework, right, to, to make sense. I mean, it's is this really adaptation, or is it just uh, I don't know, uh, like a consequence of the some other structure? But so. Uh, Right now, I try to, to summarize what we know. Most of the plants that we have looked at uh, so far, I don't know why, but there seems to be a bias towards uh, looking at these for gymnosperms. So gymnosperms, uh, they're more basal, and apparently all the gymnosperms, they seem to be able to, that have been looked, they seem to be able to do that. We don't have, uh, if, if you consider the tropics, for example, we have very little information on that, so we don't really have an idea of how that varies in, uh, across the phenologies, in, uh, in different groups. Uh, but my, my understanding is that uh, I would expect some kind of trade-off. Uh, just that the explanation that I gave about the cuticle, uh, I think there might be first a plastic component. So basically, uh, if a plant lives in an environment where there is no uh, for example, the atmosphere does not get <coughs> too desiccating most of the time. The, the sealing of the leaf is not something that uh, is very important uh, somehow. So they, they might be more permeable leaves for both directions. So they might have, for example, higher cuticular transpiration, which is not transpiration via the stomata. Uh, so it might just be a reflection more to these average atmospheric conditions that the plants might be living. I really don't know if this is maybe an adaptation. I really, I really don't know. But I think this is something that we need. Actually, I think, I think in the paper, in this review of a goldsmith, he tried to put in a phylogeny, but I don't remember. Uh, do you remember, Lou? I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it was quite common in, in, in different... All over the place. All over the place, yeah. So maybe, maybe it's something more common than we... Uh, yeah, it's just a, a, another possibility of, uh, of uh, absorption, uh, yeah. It'd be neat if it were like a universal tree tree yeah. that is just more strongly manifest yes. in the cloud forest versus something that emerged as selection to that cloud environment. 
Yeah. So. Yeah, but since, since this, because there has been a recent review that has actually looked at all different taxes that has been investigated to, uh, uh, to this uh, trait, and apparently it seems to be more widespread. So apparently it's not really like a specialization of crowd forestries. That's the message that we know so far. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so uh, my, my understanding was that, of course, being permeable, in terms of being able to absorb water for, for leaves was always at the cost of also being permeable when in terms of losing water, yeah. which is sometimes not very good for leaves. Yes. But this fact that cuticles can change so dramatically, as you said, which yeah. I really know very little about, that changes the story quite, yes. quite a bit. So I, do, do you think that it's, it could be that they change so much that this, this trade-off doesn't really exist? So they can be mm. very tight when they need to and very yeah. permeable when... <laughs> Well, uh, again, I think we, we, we don't know because no one has actually looked at this uh, plasticity effect. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I think that's actually quite interesting. It, it gives a full another perspective on this. Uh, maybe it's not really uh, uh, like a, a trait that is fixed. Maybe it's just a... Uh, and uh, well, the only, the only uh, indication <coughs> that I, I have that it, this can be highly plastic was this experience that we did with two species. Uh, growing one in an extremely wet environment and the same group of plants in a more in a dry environment but the soil conditions were the same what was changing was actually just the atmosphere and, the, and they produced leaves with very contrasting properties so uh, yeah I think this is something that uh, uh, we should look at I think that's that's cool that you're raising this uh, yeah I think we don't know it. <laughs> yeah, I responded to that. Yeah, cool. I think I read somewhere, yeah. I remember uh -huh. where, regarding this, that uh, the, the response of a uh, cute course, uh, the flexibility, the plasticity, yeah. let's yeah. say, uh, had a response range uh, that was like on a seasonal basis or something like that. It means that. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to change the composition um, and mm -hmm. the thickness, for yeah. example, of the cuticle, the response to <coughs> some disturbance or whatever yeah, yeah. that be quicker than a few months, two, three yeah, months. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't remember where I read it. Yeah, it's, uh, I think there is a very active uh, group in Germany working on, on cuticles. I think it's a uh, Riederer, uh, yes, uh, they, I mean, apparently it's, it's, it's the focus of their research. They have all kinds of techniques, but ba they can basically show uh, the production of all these epicuticular waxes under the contrasting conditions. Uh, when I started reading this, I was really fascinated because I didn't know it, it could be so, uh, so dynamic, uh, these, these, these um, surfaces. And, uh, and then it, it also, affects a lot uh, the surface tension of the leaves, uh, which is also a, a crucial uh, step for, for, especially for liquid water to actually uh, be able to, to get in. So it, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a whole micro uh, scale uh, process and, and, and universe that should be more investigated. And, yeah. and yes, and on top of this, there is also dust Yes, 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 yes. That changes the ideology also because they can retain the water and yes, yes, more slowly and yes. Yeah, there has been uh, some really interesting uh, work of also a German researcher, Bur Burkhardt. Uh, he actually is pointing exactly to this point that uh, uh, his his work uh, is showing that. Most of the leaves are full of dirt on top of it, and it basically those act as surfactants. Uh, so they really, they really break the surface tension of, of leaves. Uh, and he actually, in one of the papers, I think 2014, he actually some some videos where uh, he shows uh, how the effect of these surfactants on the like the water movement inside the leaves, and it, it's really, it's really nice. You can actually watch uh, it happening uh, live. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. So it's a good, good comment. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.